Thank you all for joining us for a live panel discussion with William Morris. This past summer, I had the pleasure of visiting Bill in Washington State. It was during this visit that I was able to see firsthand the massive endeavor that was taking place in the studio, the infamous barn, with the reworking of Mazurka. Absolutely amazing experience for both my wife and I. More importantly, I was able to get a glimpse of what makes Bill Morris tick. He traveled to our host's home in his truck, toting two paddle boards, and had stopped a few times along the long drive to pull over and take a paddle down the river. Very typical Bill Morris. Um, he arrived in his swim trunks, skin freshly worn from the elements and holding a baby bird named Pika in his hand. He had found the bird several days earlier, fragile after falling from a tree. He was taking great instinctive pleasure in nursing Pika back to life. Clearly this bird and being on the river made Bill feel complete. We are here today to learn more about this man who is truly, who truly is living nature every day now since he left the studio six years ago. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panel here. Um, we are fortunate to have two individuals join us as panelists today. Both men have had the opportunity to work with Bill in different creative pursuits. John Andres is the director of Bill's film, Creative Nature, and the co-founder and director of Spot Creative in New York. John had the opportunity to travel and work closely with Bill in the mountains and on the water while filming his comprehensive documentary. And a big thank you to James Yud, author of several books and essays about William Morris and a professor of contemporary art history and criticism at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. So once again, thank you all, and we'll get started. Okay, well, thank you for that kind introduction, and Bill, good to see you. Um, and I, as a Chicagoan, I, I do want to uh, not forget to welcome everyone to our city and hope that you're enjoying uh, uh, your weekend in Chicago. And uh, thank the Wexler Gallery for their work in organizing this, and Holly Lyon for her always a great uh, help in all of these endeavors. And uh, we have some of Bill's crew here uh, as well, and so we're, we're looking forward to an interesting and lively and hopefully reflective discussion on what Bill's been up to over the last uh, four or five years. Uh, we will take questions from the audience towards the end, the last 10 or 15 minutes or so, so please, while we're, uh, while John and I are, are uh, asking questions, you'll be thinking of some of yours that we omit or that uh, uh, you'd like answered, uh, and so um, I'll be happy to take them towards the end of our time together. So I'll begin, Bill, first of all, wonderful to see you again, even virtually see you again. Um, I think a good way always to start is like, like, what's your day going to be like today in Hawaii? Uh, what is, what are sort of the things that you might do that are that are any of our business? Uh, at least. Um, uh, so what, what's a typical what day? Like, like, what, what's a typical day like? This particular day, in particular, or yes. any general day? I, I'd like what to start it? with this particular day. It's early morning there. I'd like to know sort of the next. 16 hours, sort of what your the trajectory of your day would be, and you can then compare it to a typical day. Well, on this particular day, it's always, it usually it revolves a lot around the weather. And, and, and this particular day, we have about a four to five foot northwest, west, northwest swell coming. It's breaking right in front of my house here. So if I keep looking out here and seem a little distracted, I'm just checking the set, okay? <laughs> So that's where I would normally be at this time right now. Okay, I was up at five, coffee's already been down, had a fruit smoothie, and um, there's a great set coming in right now. <laughs> as much as I'm enjoying being here, I'm just a little bit distracted. <laughs> but uh, again, we don't have that very often. Uh, the day usually consists of either um, a paddle or a swim to start the day, and then um, it depends. I'll either be working on some stone, I'll be fishing. Um, I'm working on a, small, a couple small projects right now with a, a videographer on uh, an old elderly fisherman that lives in the village here, and there's just a lot of things going on. So, but it's it's not a singular formal day where I have a schedule. I don't have the discipline or the need for the regularly scheduled discipline that I had when I was blowing glass. Um, you mentioned that you, you might be carving some stone or possibly even carving some wood today. Could you, could you uh, and that's not been a secret that you've been 
fiddling as a, as a creative individual. Could you put that into context for us a little bit? Are you making objects potentially for the market? Is this simply for your use and the use of your friends? Uh, tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing in wood and, and stone. Well, the, the work has been um, for the main reason of starting to understand different materials and working with the local materials. The wood that I did was all local indigenous woods, and then the stone is all the, uh, the lava stone from the island. Now, there's a, a tradition and a myth that we don't remove any of the stone from the island, so none of the works that I have made are sold in, an, in a formal art setting at all. Some of the pieces are sold, and all of the proceeds from those pieces go either to nonprofits or it's sort of a form of giving back uh, to different uh, communities or programs on the island uh, just as all as donation. But it's a way for me to uh, spend time connecting with my hands, connecting with the material, and the environment that I work in is very simplistic. I don't need a lot of space. It's one or two simple tools, and I work by the shore side. And it's more contemplative, um, exploratory, and um, it's not, nobody really sees it except my friends. And, and the, the, the community of friends here are not from the art world. They're more uh, fishermen and surfers and uh, that sort of thing. Bill, I'm kind of wondering, we talk a lot when we were making the film about the idea of like, pursuing things, you know, making things and eventually it's going to go in the art world. But part of that was, for you, was the sense of bliss, was finding that you know, that inner sense of joy in yourself and, and what you're doing at the moment. I'm, I'm curious, now that there's, you don't have the target of making art for the market, do you still have that ability to find the bliss on a day-over-day -day basis? I mean, how, are you filling that need for yourself? We don't, you know, we just mentioned that earlier and joked about it a little bit, and I think what I've come to realize is that you don't find it, it finds you. And, and like I said, when you chase it down, it's sort of like, it's sort of like hound hunting rabbits, you know, when, once you find it, it's exhausted and then it ends up being killed. So I don't really feel like I'm, I, I'm pursuing it deliberately, but I know that the things that make me happy are the things that engage me outside of myself. Um, learning about this environment here, starting to understand the ocean and the people that relate to it. When I moved here, I thought I knew a little bit about the ocean and I thought I knew a little bit about how to be in it and be with it. And I realized after a few years of being here, I know nothing and there's so much to learn and there's so many great mentors here. So when I'm absorbing those things, yeah, it's absolutely blissful to me because it, the, the perspective is so open-ended and it's so big because there's so much to learn. I mean, there's so much intelligence in that sea. And it's, it, it makes you feel really small, and I like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, in a certain sense, the change you made a number of years ago was instead of sort of demonstrating your bliss, or the word I used to use a lot with you was empathy, that you had this empathy for earlier cultures and other civilizations. Rather than demonstrate it through the creation of art objects, you're, you're almost just living it. Uh, you don't really feel a need to show everybody that you understand, uh, you know, deep human uh, uh, nature kinds of uh, situations. You're just content now to live it. Is there any sort of truth to something like that? Actually, that pretty much puts the nail on the head, James, because it's a lot less, now that I'm living here and I'm experiencing and sharing some concepts with some, these are real Hawaiians. Uh, this man that, we're, that I've been working with who's been my mentor as far as fishing here is, is mastered 14 different of the ancient fish, fishing methods. And we're talking from catching crabs, netting opelu, uh, bottom fishing, um, uh, uh, long lining for ahi, all kinds of things like that. And, and he's been doing this, he started doing this when he was 10 years old. The family just basically took him out of school and said, you're going to be a fisherman for our family. And they've done this every generation. They chose one family member. He can't read or write. Um, he is one of the sort of the purest people I've ever met in my life and his level of contentment and relationship to the ocean is profound so I look at this in awe realizing I could never have that level of purity and that kind of connection but being able to witness it makes me realize that I need to curb my own kind of multifaceted ambition where I want to like 
figure all this out. I, it's just, I just want to experience it at the rate that I can, which is a neophyte. And um, they don't know anything about what I did, and the whole glass movement and all that. So it's, it sort of takes an entire backseat and just an individual that just wants to learn and wants to help out when I, when I can. And um, uh, it, it's just very real. And the, I like the simplicity of that. Do you find any correlation with where you are in, in that pursuit now to where you were when you were 19 and uh, first arrived at Pilchuck when you were just experiencing that world? You're now experiencing a new world, a new discovery. Any correlation for you? It feels almost the same, except I'm not 19, I'm 56. So I don't have that. <laughs> I don't have that, um, uh, just that hypertensity to, to just, it's, I'm a lot more relaxed, I'm a lot more uh, patient with the, the, the information, the way it comes, and a lot more thoughtful about it, and not so aggressively uh, starved. Because I have a lot more faith in the fact that you just are around these people and you develop a relationship, and it takes much longer than you think. Just like the relationship it took with working with Pilchuck or other artists or our, our crew working together. It took years to develop that and I realized I can't come in if I want it to be really authentic and deeply seated. I need to just be patient with it. And I've only been here for, what, six years now. Well, one of the reasons we're here today uh, is because you, you made some news, perhaps without intending to make some news earlier this year when you decided to come back to the States and reconfigure some of the P Mazorka pieces. Could you tell us a little bit about how that came about and what your thoughts were about it and what it was like to uh, you know, return to the States and get in, if not a hot shop, into a studio uh, again and uh, uh, you know, re-look at the work and reconfigure it? Well, Holly told me to do it. <laughs> okay, we can move on to the next one. <laughs> I'm sure she's bright red right now. I wish I could see her. Wow. Three shades of red. <laughs> Three shades of red, Bill. You know, actually, that was that was a it was a really fun, gratifying, reflective project. Um, I always I loved the piece. We documented the piece as we configured it when we first made it, and. Um, you know, we, we have all these, we have this, these artifacts laying around and, and uh, you know, the idea of talking about this show and, you know, we still are selling archive works and that sort of thing and we talked about reconfiguring it. And <clears throat> I know that James, I want to hear his explanation of uh, sort of the curatorial reason for why or what you would call that, but I know that when we went in and started working with a piece, we still retained the idea, I feel like what the, the, the concept behind Mazorka was always authentic, that never deviated in the reconfiguration. It just made it more intimate and more accessible. And, you know, I got back into the studio with John and Tremaine, and it was like we had we'd taken a two-week break. Um, other than a few more gray hairs and moving a little slower. Other than that, it was, it was just like breathing again. And it felt great. And it wasn't like we could just, <clears throat> it was just a way of, it was just a revisitation on a lot of levels. And the nice thing was, it wasn't we were making some big, big radical change. We were just doing a, a shift in the, in the presentation and in sort of the, uh, the language of that particular piece. You know, in conversation with somebody, I compared that to what you and Graham did over the years to that myth object and the animal show, that at each subsequent venue, the show must have circulated for seven or eight years or something, you would update it with some new work and maybe fiddle around with the trophy panel or something like that. You know, it would, it would not be the same show over and over again. You'd adjust some of the pieces and add pieces in and take pieces out. I mean, some were signature pieces. I think cash was in every one. But uh, it, it, whenever I would travel around and see the show, it would be almost a different exhibition uh, at each subsequent venue. So you've done this kind of thing before where you've gone back to pre-existing bodies of work and adjusted them. Uh, let, let's be perfectly clear because we have an audience here and I want to make sure we get this right. Uh, but I, I know the answer to this. You did not do any hot work. You did not blow no. any glass in this project. So, so speak a little bit more perhaps about what you did do physically to the objects 
uh, from the original incarnation of Mazorka to the some of the changes that have happened in this newer uh, manifestation of them? Well, the original concept of the piece was, of course, the you know specific objects that dealt with the concept of corn and and uh, the the Latin American sort of myth and and uh, reverence for corn and what it means to that culture and the association of objects. And so what this was was just taking a, a broad view and getting more specific. So taking, instead of realizing that you can associate four or five objects together, you might associate one or two objects together. And it would just be a more intimate uh, way of saying the same thing. And that's really all it felt like I was doing to me. I mean, we used the, the same material, the same rope, uh, the, the concept of the steel frame, it, it just became more more refined and, and uh, sort of miniaturized. Has, has the the power of the story changed at all for you? The the story of of Mazorka and the you know the 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 at home farm has, has it changed by the re-edit? As in my vernacular, you've re-edited Mazorka. Has the story changed for you at all? Well, all, all of the stories that I look back on have evolved a little bit, changed. I see everything in hindsight. Um, my opinions of my own thoughts have changed about things. But basically, for that particular piece, no, not at all. I don't feel like they have at all. But, no. well, one of the other things that I find really interesting um, about the new edits, again, as in my brain, that's the way it is, um, is what you and Tremaine and Johnny have done is the finish work of it, of, of the finishing of the knots and those types of things are so much cleaner than what was done originally in Palm Springs and then subsequently, I guess, in Tacoma. It was the ends were, you know, freer and looser and everything else, and now everything is so much more precise. And I'm that, uh, for me, that was the biggest thing because I think when you guys did it in Palm Springs while we were uh, shooting the film, one was time, you had to get it up and, you know, there was a, there was a moment where the gallery was opening and, and the show was starting and you, you had to be done and it was a lot of glass to hang. Um, but, so if you left the ends loose where I remember, you know, if we had more time, I might finish those ends. But, it, you know, now they're all finished and uh, I'm kind of curious what you think about that. We can pass a mic here as well but what's your thought about that about the reincarnation of it in that sense well you know basically it, it, my my view of that my reflection on that is that that piece because of its scale and this huge amassing of objects was more of a barnyard feel it was more than what you'd see in the fields of Mexico whereas what we have now is where you've taken those things out of the barn and you've more put them, you know, maybe in the home, just as a representation of that concept. Um, and then, uh, not to mention, you can, you know, you couldn't climb up on a ladder and see all those knots. And now you can get close and intimate. And you know, having Tremaine's skill in, in, in stitching these these knots and coming up with a particular knot, this uh, this clove hitch. Which took her forever to learn. Oh, shut up. <laughs> when she got it, she really got it. Um, you know, and then and just the refinement of using that particular knot, which is such a, a world-renowned, just common way of fastening. So, you know, we we tried to retain that authenticity as far as the, the casualness. But then again, when you're looking at it, there was something beautiful about that refinement. She just did such a great job that we just kind of let her let it just get refined in that manner. You want to add anything? <laughs> Tremaine. Tremaine's here, she has a mic, so let's see if she wants to add anything. No, it was, just, it was two completely different, it felt like two completely different projects, though. I mean, obviously, yeah, the first one was meant to be, you know, kind of at the market or at a barn, or it was meant to be kind of more loose, and this was, you know, definitely needed to be more refined. But it was obviously, I mean, this is Bill's work, this was Bill's aesthetic too. And, and he's really good at reining me in, because as he knows, I could end up fiddling with stuff for hours if he didn't keep me in check. But, yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, I'm kind of curious. The team is here in, in front of us, or a large portion of the team, not everyone, obviously, over the years. Um, but 
Um, my experience with you and the team was I kept finding these moments of great joy that you would find in their expression of your work, you know, their involvement of what you did and the energy that they brought into the hot shop each day and the Tremaine as you were finishing pieces and things like that. We, we talked a lot about the collective, you know, one, Mazurka is the collective, it is this amassing of all this stuff, but you had this wonderful collective of people as well, and I'm wondering if you miss that interaction, it's a different set of friends in Hawaii, you know, as you told us, but do you miss that daily interaction on uh, the pursuit of, you know, the creating something with the team, do you miss that? I, I do miss that. I miss it, you know, for our work when we were making objects, we were, it was, there was a schedule to it. So there was something you could look forward to every day. And you knew you were going to go into this environment that had these people that you had this intimate relationship with, and you were all present for, you know, we were just there for the unexpected every day, but everybody was very supportive. And of course, here I don't have that on a daily basis. There's a lot more, it's a lot more individuality. And when I get together with my friends and we do something like we, we go dive together, or we, you know, we're crabbing together, we're surfing together, it's, it's a more immediate intensity, but you don't, have to, you don't have the things to show for it. You don't have that lineage. You, you collect experiences, but you don't have the objects as the sort of uh, m memorials to those to those moments and what's so great about I'm just seeing the team on the Skype just before the lecture here you know looking at everybody and just feeling that the reminiscence and, and the connection with all that we've been through I mean we have been through so much together and you know it's the, you have the smiles and you have that and the questions but there really doesn't need to be anything said I mean that's a lifelong relationship like my relationship with Dale like what I have with these guys and and even the things I've done with you guys, there's this, that connection is based on something very tangible. It's like that great quote that, you know, we can't have ideas and rumination. We need objects to, you know, record these experiences. And that's the manifestation. And we have so much of that. And, you know, this is an example of that. Yeah, in a certain way, that, that takes me to the, the next question I was going to ask. Because I know, looking back on your career, as a, as a visual artist, a sculptor worked in glass. And it would be silly to just think about it about the end of it and, and the things that made you decide to retire from being active. And I know in your memories you're thinking about the 20 years before that and all of the relationships and the people that you worked with and, and you know what it meant when you were 21 and you knew that Dale trusted you. Uh, would look, would say, you know, could use you as as another vehicle through which he could do his art, and saw you develop. Could you talk a little bit about what some of the high points were? I don't mean particular exhibitions or, or particular awards or something, but but when you when you do think back to that life that you led, um, what what are the, the the threshold moments or the the ones that you still can savor today? Well. Yeah, that's actually a really good question because for me, it, it isn't it isn't awards or it isn't exhibitions. It's when I look back on it now, and of course hindsight has a very different view. But I, remember, you know, one of the fondest times was you know starting working with Dale and Pilchuck when I was there as a neophyte. You know, my first couple years there, and just throwing myself into that uh, way of life and witnessing how these artists would live, and then. Throughout the time, it's like, and then I remember uh, when I stopped working for Dale and started uh, renting Pilchuck for myself and the formation of our own crew and realizing <laughs> firsthand how that type of, of life and commitment and relationships for myself were coming into fruition, were manifesting in the form of objects. And I... Uh, you know, I, I've got to say that I can't, I, it's not poignant on, on really certain epics with me, but it's more like a, a sound wave where there were obviously highs and lows, but, but now in, in hindsight, those lows don't have the pain that they had at the time. So in a way, there's a sweetness to them. You know, like when we were struggling with, uh, I would be, you know, in some mood swing because of some foul relationship or who knows what, or, you know, my kids going through something, they would come into the hot shop. 
and, and I would have a certain time where I was relating to the people and the work. And I look at that and realize, at the time it was difficult, but now I look at it as kind of a beautiful time because it was very supportive and it was very safe and it was very, it brought so much positive into my life, you know? And so when I look back on things like that, that's, that's a real nice way to reflect on an aspect of your life that at the time might have been seemingly depressed. So I'm grateful for, you know, pretty much all of it, James. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just kind of curious that, you know, I remember the phone call you, you gave me when you, you know, just before the announcement was public, you called me and said, you know, I'm, uh, I'm done. Um, and you struggled that day with the word retired. Um, and I think that, you know, that's a phrase that became easy for everyone else uh, to apply to it. What is, I remember, you know, distinctly saying he's not saying that he's retired. Um, and it left this ambiguity out there of, is he retired? Is he not? Is, you know, when, when it happened and when the announcement was made, you know, talk about that idea of retirement for you because you're clearly working, you're clearly uh, creating things and, you know, being a creative spirit, what does retirement mean to you and did you fully retire at that moment? Um, well, you know, Holly has a really good insight because we had dialogue about this for almost a year before it actually happened. You know, that was all on a very intimate level. But, um, yeah, I, you know, you've got to come up, you've got to say something. Uh, and retirement from that aspect of the art world, my participation in an active art, and when I say art world, I mean more art market. Um, but then again, on my close uh, association with, uh, well, I never had much association with the, with, the, uh, uh, with the galleries, that sort of thing, that was usually through Holly, but it was just the idea, of, you know, because we still have the shows, I mean, there's still archive work being sold, it's just, I'm just not, I don't participate in it anymore. I don't, it doesn't, it doesn't occupy a, but a very, very, very small space in my, in my daily thinking these days. So yes, I've retired from that and I've retired from the formality of, of the exhibitions, the shows, and of running the, the, the system, running the mechanism that produces that work. Yeah, you know, I mean, that mechanism doesn't exist anymore for me. Yeah, I sense that everybody's first reaction is, well, why is he walking away? Because, you know, no one, we, you had taken a sabbatical a couple of years before, and people knew about that. And uh, uh, so when we, the, new, the news, which was news for me, I mean, I hadn't expected it. And so my first reaction is, what is he walking away from? But the, the, as the years have gone by, and I've heard from you, you know, through other people, et cetera, I know that you were really walking towards something as much as you were walking away from something. You know, that's exactly what I was going to interject and say while you were saying that. That's what I felt like I've done. James, you're always so good at making well, you feel good at But at the time, you, uh, you, and you probably can understand that, everybody thought, well, it was that pressure, you know, like three weeks before you were going to show up at Pilchuck, you know, what's the new body we're going to be? And the, and the three or four months, and John and I have seen you in Pilchuck, we know how hard you and the crew worked. You know, those, those months were hard, hard, hard. And then we thought maybe we just had, had kind of burned out. Uh, but it wasn't that, and it never was that. It really was this other desire to, you know, explore other parts of your being and maybe be in a position where you could do it and do it as a young man and, uh, uh, and savor uh, uh, those things. So, so you know, uh, if you'd like to speak to that, please do, but, and maybe you could join it to why Hawaii then? Uh, uh, why, uh, you know, what, what, what is it about Hawaii that uh, has, has called you to, to be there as opposed to the coast of Mexico or uh, Africa or Australia? I mean, there are lots of places you could be, but you're on the big island of Hawaii for some <coughs> reason, I assume? You know, and that's a good question, and, and the reasons are not as important as you might think. I think the idea is that philosophically, I've always believed that it's not, everything that we do is just a byproduct of who we are, who we're supposed to become in, in this process. And, you know, shifting from what we do is, is very small in comparison to our, our our deeper nature and our bigger picture. It's a manifestation. So whether you're blowing glass 
or whether you're you know learning about fishing in Hawaii, it, it, it's still you just it's just a re-manifestation of a force. Um, the thing with Hawaii that's unique is the the elements that are here are very pure, and, and probably the one thing people ask me that question why Hawaii, and I always say the water, because the water is bluer and clearer and deeper and more isolated than any other place on the planet. Um, I considered Mexico, I considered back to California, but there was something about culturally here, Mexico interested me a lot, but um, the water is, and it's wonderful there, but it is not as, I don't know, uh, compellingly crystalline and pure as it is here. And there's a, culturally there's a lot of depth here that is very, very specific. The Polynesian culture is more specific in some ways than, than Latin America. Um, but I, as far as even some of the, the deeper compulsions or, or callings to be here, I'm still figuring that out as I go. And I'm, I keep coming up with the fact that I've made a very good decision and I'm very, very content here. Uh, it's funny, I, for everyone here, that some people know, some people met them. I have two daughters that are now teenage daughters, and, and at one point of making the film, they were along with us, and it was a, a, a life-altering uh, experience for my daughters who were very young at the time. Um, and uh, Bill just, you know, they live in the shadows of Manhattan. Um, so they're not, you know, big outdoorsy kids. They're, you know, a suburbanites, and that's what they do. And, we were out in, uh, in Western Washington, and um, Bill said, okay, we're gonna go, we're gonna do a paragliding sequence for the movie. And uh, Bill said, okay, we've gotta go up, you know, 3,000 feet at the top of this, this a plateau, and that's where I, I launched from. So we didn't tell the girls, we just said, we're, we're climbing this hill. Uh, we're scrambling across Point Granite, we're doing all these amazing things, and, you know, Bill normally does that hike. I want to say he used to do it in about 50 minutes with you and Roy and the other guys that you always flew with. It took us about three and a half hours. Now, to, in, in our defense, we had a 50 pounds of gear on our back and cameras and lights and all kinds of stuff that we're all uh, packing up with. But the reality is there's no way we're doing this in 50 minutes. Bill could have gone up and down and up and down and up and down five times by the time we actually got there. But. Um, that's a big long story of the idea of you've been around cultural things and experiences that you share these ideas with others um, at, as you go through. I, I think of you as this magnet of personality that others kind of find you and you find them. Are you still finding that there in Hawaii that, that a sense of magnetism where like you're drawn to this fisherman and you're making this film about the fisherman, which I think is really cool. That it's for me, it's kind of come like you know a full circle. <laughs> it is a guy who struggled, believe it or not. Bill really struggled while we were making the film with like, contextualizing what he does because he just did it. You know, he never talked about it in that way with the camera in his face. And believe it or not, as as profound as Bill is, and you know, I think we captured a number of those moments in the film. Bill really struggled with that process as we were making the film because he didn't. He didn't want it to be something it wasn't. Um, and I think he did a nice job with it. And um, we kind of protected each other that way a little bit. But you still find yourself being that magnet where this fisherman finds you, you find the fisherman, how that interplay happens with you in, in the, the life you have now. That's a good question, because it is very different here. Because this, this particular gentleman has you know, he's only been off island maybe two, three times in his life. And um, and he is a really pure, he's a fisherman. That's what he's been doing for the last 65 years. And that's his language that he speaks, but for some reason he's receptive to me. And um, he's taught me a lot. He's, uh, he's shared some great artifacts with me. He's given me some of his really, really wonderful possessions. And I I don't know what it is, and it's there's not a lot of it's not philosophical in the sense of theoretical. It's more, it's more he shares his beliefs, which border, some of them border on myth about the Polynesian culture and the respect for the ocean and um, the way you, you treat things in that, 
in that way. And it's, for him, there's not a lot of distraction. So the, there's the purity, but for some reason, he knows that this project is meaningful. That to, to, for, for him to share something that when he dies is going to be lost. He's a net maker, he's a Nilpella fisherman, and his style of fishing is unique to this area of the world, to anywhere in the world, and even to this area of the world. So um, going out with him and then trying to put together something to preserve this and yet share his respect to the environment. And then also, the reason why this happened is that it's my friends that I've, I've come to know here, uh, many of which were born and raised here, uh, grew up around Uncle Chucky, and they, you know, they, they remember some of their first memories of scrubbing ahi blood out of his cooler when they were four years old. And these guys are now 40 years old, and the respect they have for this man is profound. And for me, what that represents is real authenticity when it comes to a community and honoring something that has real meaning to its people. I mean, the fishermen here were like, they were like priests because they fed the village. I mean, but it wasn't a hierarchical thing where there was this big ego attached. It was just what they did. And uh, if you went fishing, you never spoke the word that you were going fishing. You were going hole to hole. You were taking a walk. Uh, you didn't... Uh, you never looked at a fisherman the day he went out. You always kept your eyes down. Um, there's these wonderful myths, and it's out of respect. And you didn't, you didn't, dis you didn't dishonor these things. And today, there's still a few guys that are my age or younger that are my friends that are doing this. And uh, one of my friends that was here visiting yesterday, 40 years old, he's been off island once, you know. And yet, his perspective, talking about Uncle Chuck and, and that sort of thing, is. It's so, it, he has such an insight that I envy because he sees that purity where we have so much distraction. And, um, and I don't know why they tend to, to they allow me into their circle, but I don't know if I just entertain them as a dumb holly or what, but it's a pretty, I feel very fortunate to have the friends I have here. Yeah. Well, let me ask, because my perception of you when, you know, I, I knew you was a, a man of was working at, at, at obviously fabricating glass, but you were a man of the mountains and the woods. That was how I would visualize you. And you seem to have shifted from that to a, a man of the sea now, because almost you never really seem to talk very much about the mountains that are around you or the lava flows that are not too far from you, etc. Uh, it's really about the sea. Uh, and you said that one of the main reasons you moved to Hawaii was because of the water. Uh, in your mind, have you thought about why that might be? What is, uh, you know, you were born near the sea, right? You were born in a... In a, in a oh, yes, Carmel, Carmel, California. Right, so you were yeah. born by the sea or something. Is it something about the water that is speaking to you much more clearly now than it did 15 years ago? Uh, maybe it's just standing in front of a furnace for 35 years and finally to cool off. <laughs> <laughs> no, but... Um, no, it is. It is a shift. But when I, but you know, I still have my own cabin up in the mountains in Washington. I go back there for three months out of the year, and I get to really experience the mountains. So I have that connection. I like the break of getting off this rock. Um, there's something very, very corrosive about the sea. That the presence of it is is very overpowering, especially living next to it. Um, you know, the salt eats everything, and the wind, and the elements. But there's something uh, very cooling about it, and it's such a different world for me. Uh, and that's what I like. I, I, I get to relearn or I think, you know, when it comes to nature, it's, it's very, it, it, it's tr it's tr it transcends it's very easily from one element to the next. But um, the way the body relates to it and the way you perceive the information and the life there is a, is a new set of skills. And that's what I love. I love exploring those new skills and learning them from people that literally do it like breathing. Yeah. And let me so one follow up. The, if I'm correct, would you say the, the I hate to use words like the last body of your work, it came out of the Mazorka work, but you were working on things there, there at the end of John's film, as I recall, where there were, you were doing fish on netting yes. kind of things. Little so, fish in glass. Right. And I, I think you say something yeah. like that, how you didn't want to make well, I never did. little crystal little crystal fish or something. Uh, you get 11,000 of a Murano in, in two minutes. Um, so is that, first of all, is that accurate? Was the, again, you didn't know it was the last body worker, maybe you didn't know. Um, there was, you were working on fish imagery uh, at, towards the end of your working as a hot glass worker, is that correct? 
Yeah, it was. It wasn't really about the fish. It was more about the fishing, the fish right. traps, and the, the fish were more. They were. They were more symbolic. Uh, as the bounty, you know, just like the corn was more metaphorical. But yeah, that's exactly right. The fish and all the tools that uh, were associated with that idea. How important were those travels? You took many, many travels to, you know, Europe early with Flora and Joey and all kinds. How important were those travels ultimately for you? Um, and are you still traveling? I mean, are you still going to, you know, uh, Austro Asia from time to time? Or is it really Washington State and Hawaii and, and, and back and forth? Or do you still travel the world from time to time? You know, the only trips I've taken recently have been uh, with my son. We went to uh, India uh, last year and uh, flew our paragliders in the Himalayas for two weeks. A profound experience. And yet it wasn't so much about culturally as it was about the experience and sharing it with my son. And um, it was it was an experience of a lifetime is all I can tell you. If you want to get on YouTube and view flyinginindia.dv, my son put together this little video and it will blow your mind what we got to do together. So that still goes on. Well, it's come a full circle because there's a moment in the film and it's maybe one of my favorite moments um, that still uh, being a dad you know, of two girls Bill talks about his relationship with his father in the film, um, and it's uh, it's quite extraordinary of Bill's love of the mountains and his, you know, where he found that from his father at a young age, who, um, you know, was really profound to me, and you know, I try to find that in my life with my daughters. So it's it's lovely to hear you talk about that with Roy, because it's uh, it's it's a moment of the film that I, you know, when I see it, it. it uh, jumps off the screen at me personally, so that's really lovely to hear. Yeah. Well, we'll be turning uh, to questions from the audience. So I'll just sort of say a quick thing or two. So get ready to raise your hand, or uh, and Sherry, you're going to go around with the mic. Sherry's going to go around with the mic, and uh, uh, you know, if I have to, I'll repeat them for for Bill. Hopefully, he'll be able to hear them. So uh, I'll just say uh, because we may not get a chance to say at the end. To thank you uh, very much for taking the time to do this. I also want to thank you for inviting me to be a little part of the, the journey that you took. It, it was a, a, a chapter of my professional life that I remember with great, great, great fondness. And uh, I'm always proud to see the, those books on people's shelves, uh, et cetera. <laughs> and so uh, thanks a lot for, for, for taking me for a bit of a ride. And I'm sure John feels the same way. And uh, I certainly recommend his film very highly to all of you, uh, as well as beautiful, beautiful piece of work. Thank you. I mean, as, as I said in a series of emails uh, through the gallery, I wish I had written that. I wish I had said that. So, <laughs> uh, it's funny, James. I, I'll say this: Bill's books, the coffee table books, when we started the film, were very much involved in our visual approach and our understanding. And James writing about Bill and you know putting it in, in a perspective very much informed. We haven't had a chance to talk about it, but very much informed my understanding of what needed to be said about Bill. And I, you know, I'd like to think that we've done that and, and I think for some of the people who know him best are the people that he spent countless hours with in the hot shop and, and Holly, uh, you know, when we first screened the film in its premiere in Seattle, um, you know, it, it was really nice. There was a few of them who, who I got to spend a lot of time with and, and understand Bill and they had a simple comment of, I think I understand Bill even a little bit better after seeing the film. So. Um, to plug myself in a sense and, and to plug Bill what he was able to accomplish in the film I think the uh, you know we were able to capture that moment in time and I think the value of this today is this is a different moment in time for Bill and that's very clear to me today and I appreciate being a part of it so thank you Bill for including me in this and Bill James. hates that we did this <laughs> he hates that we did this but I never got my fantasy fulfilled which is why I always wanted one day to be on stage with Bill and sort of and says Who's that guy next to Jimmy Yud? <laughs> I still, I still dream of that day. <laughs> Who's that guy next to Jimmy Yud? <laughs> and even here, you're even here, you're four times as big as I am. <laughs> um, well, I'd like to let me. I just add something to it, and this is just such a pleasure because this has been such a long hiatus from this life, and to see you two guys who have just been so amazing in your work and helping me with my career and really 
has been such a platform for me and made me look so good. I just can't thank you enough. And it's so great to know that the crew are there and how much they've done. And it's just, it's really a collective of, of everybody's huge, just effort and love and having a good time and, and just, I, I'm just so, everybody can still share. This is sort of, this continuum just keeps going. So thank you all very much. Right. Yeah. Well, do we have uh, some uh, questions or comments uh, from the audience? A gentleman right behind you, Sherry, two rows behind you. Um, if, you if you wouldn't mind coming to the mic, because it's the board only. Yeah, come on up to the board. Let's bring the mic to that gentleman, if you could. This one, I think, can reach. I'm just curious if you ever read the Hemingway novella, Old Man in the Sea, or did you ever <laughs> have any comments, if that's the case? Did you hear that, Bill? I did. I, it was the, the, question was, I did. the question was, have you ever read Hemingway's novella, The Old Man and the Sea? And is it something that you think about to engage with your current project? Well, uh, the, 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 the man I'm working with is, is basically the old man of the sea. Um, uh, and there's a number of them. There's one that lives just right next door to me. And, and he has a great story of catching a marlin in his, in his dugout canoe and having, him, having it drugged. The, the, the marlin drug him from Keoho to Kialikakua, and it was a 700 pound marlin. So, I mean, it's, it, it is alive here. It, it happens. And, and I get to talk to those people. Uh, yeah, so it, it's very much, it's very real myth. Other comments, Christian? Yes, I'll repeat yours. Go ahead. Um, the first time I saw your work was at SOFA uh, years ago now. And it was the series with the African face, the shield, the word, the shield, the sword, or the, the, uh, the uh, spear. And, and it, it hit me at a visceral level that I've never experienced before. And even now, and throughout all those years, anytime I look at any of your work, it, it's, I can stare at anything you've made for hours. And it, it brings out such a visceral feeling. The only, and I've the only way that can be in the piece is if you felt that from your gut and it came from some distant place through your spirit. Now that you're doing, enjoying your life and going into the challenges, my question is, what, I mean, obviously, it's like the air you breathe. You have to convey air. It's your gift. It's your calling. How do you convey it in creativity now? I mean, is there art that you feel you may need to make with the current chapter of William Morris? Well, it's hard to paraphrase uh, the question, but let me, let me try to do so, and, and the gentleman will correct me if I'm wrong. He, he spoke that the first time he saw your work, it was from the Man Adorn series uh, here at SOFA, uh, you know, probably 10 years ago, uh, and was very, very struck by it and very, very moved by it, and felt that you must have had a similar connection to the, the subject matter, uh, and that you were uh, extraordinarily creative, and that you must continue somehow to be creative uh, even now. Um, I don't know if he quite said that you had to be an artist to be creative, but that, that was sort of the point. He wanted to, to sort of sense your, uh, specifically about the Man of Doran series, uh, what were some of the, the, the ways that you were able to make those connections? No. No. Well, oh, we you know, we're going to get a mic, too. You know, uh, okay, I'll try to answer that. I think I, I, think I got the question. I, I can well, make it real quick. Those those concepts, like for example about Man Adorned, while I'm working in the hot shop, they're much more poignant and they're much more governed by the process of creating objects in glass that express a very, very particular idea. Here, I, I don't have that confinement. So the manifestation comes out in more experience. It doesn't come out so specifically in objects. I still am doing some stone objects and the hooks uh, traditional uh, fishing implements and that sort of thing. But since I don't have to do it for an exhibition that has to make a certain statement, I, it, it, it's more, a little, a little more ethereal, a little more uh, vassal. And uh, I, I like that about it because it was so disciplined for so long. And you would just take a real specific concept. And now, the concepts, I don't have to be as loyal to it. It can kind of overlap into... Uh, you know, not just the, the style of fishing or the object itself, but it can kind of spill over into the meal <laughs> of the day. And I don't know if that makes sense or that answers this question, but that sort of is my reply for what I understood. Just, do you feel the need to keep creating in any form of medium at any points? 
that part that's um, inside of you from what you're experiencing today. I feel compelled to, to, to continue to make objects. I do. I, I love working with my hands. has always been a vital language for me. Um, yes, uh, I, I do. I, I feel I feel an, an absolute need for that. So I like getting up and doing something physical every day, or you got it's a, just a form of nourishment. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Other uh, questions? You can get the mic yes, there. Thank you, sure. Yeah. I just wondered if you live with any of the objects you made back when you were working in glass, and if that part of your life is still a little bit with you because you brought some to Hawaii. No. <laughs> there's no. There's no glass here in Hawaii. Uh, I do have a, a, a piece in my little cabin up in the mountains, but no, there's no glass here. I want to say that I, I think, if my memory serves, it's been a couple years since I was there, but the little framed piece that's over his left shoulder in the center of the screen here, I believe was there when Bill bought the house. Uh, I, I'm not sure, but I know when Bill moved into the house at first, the artwork that was there when he bought the house remained in the house. And I think that, that you know, that bird over his shoulder, I believe. This exactly. Here? exactly. Yeah. I, I oh, believe that was there that's when, that's when he bought the house. That's actually a new one. Pretty much, I, yeah, that, well, you got to realize it was a rental. And <laughs> then I wasn't in a big hurry to make changes, but uh, that piece, I, I know, I, is a new piece since you were it here. Is, okay, all right, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Well, memory didn't serve well, but, but I, I, I found it very, really yeah. interesting because while we were there filming, Bill was still actively involved. I mean, he was still, you know, he was still working hard. And, you know, I found it very interesting, that question, is he surrounding himself with his art? And we got there and there was nary a Morris anywhere on the island, let alone in his house. And then when we talked about it, you know, while we were sitting there just, you know, having, you know, lunch one day, he was like, no, no, everything that's here was here when I bought the house and uh, I don't know when it's going to change. So I, I just found it very interesting that the artist was like, I've got to figure out what it becomes, but it's not me, it's not my work that I need to be surrounded by, it's other things that inspire me, and that was something I, I was always struck by with Bill. But now I do actually have, uh, I have a lot of the woodwork that I've done, and a lot of the stonework in around the house that I have worked on. So, what I never did prior with the glass, uh, for some reason I do, because it has a, a different kind of representation to me, it's a more immediate, uh, uh, sort of a document of that sort of new evolving life here, which is still very new. Any other questions or comments? Um, so, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Hi, um, I'm a glass blowing student from uh, Sheridan College in Oakville in Canada, and we recently had uh, Someone on your old team, uh, Nico Dimitrovic, uh, come in to uh, do. He came in to do some uh, hot shop demos and give us a little talk. He uh, he compared you to. He said that when you were in the hot shop working, it was like a twelve year old in the hot shop, and that the kind of the caliber of work that came out was kind of directly correlated to the amount of fun everyone was having. Um, if you got into like a negative headspace when you were working, was there? Kind of a way that you could counteract that? Did you feel that kind of seeping into your work if you were in a bad way of working? Did you just bucket the piece? Or I guess I'm just trying to kind of ask like how, like how you managed to keep dealing with the pressure of making work and having fun with it. Kind of refine that. I heard bits and pieces of that, but I need somebody needs to go over there. Sorry, um, is that better? Wrong. Is that better? Um, I was just kind of asking uh, how you dealt with the uh, pressure of continuing to make work in the hot shop and still having fun with it kind of thing. All that, I, and you're talking about while I was in the hot shop working. Yeah, kind of the old pill check day. Yeah, that, uh, you know, I, it, it's just, you know, again, it was came down to just showing up and, and never, you know, keeping your expectations relatively low, but just knowing that you just gave it your best effort every day. And that aspect of of the pressure or the successes that would happen sometimes very unto themselves would would keep that that joy and that enthusiasm alive and um, and then just not buying into the failures too much you know it was a very cyclic thing it's no different than any other day you get up and you face the day uh, full on you know you can't uh, you can't bring that 
bliss to it. You have to just be ready for it. And it was just really a day at a time process. And, and, and again, that you, you, you gain more faith. As the years go by, you gain more and more faith that, that that's authentic and all you need to do is show up, give it your best effort, and it will glean, it will glean some joy. That's great, thanks a lot. All right then, well, uh, I really am going to, I'm going to close now. Do you have anything? But yeah, what I want to do, I, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't introduce the team. Um, Kelly, Kelly O'Dell, please stand up. Uh, Karen, Karen Wilson, Randy Walker, Ross Richmond, Tremaine Mason, and I think probably she doesn't want to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Holly Lyman. Yeah. Thank you. Hopefully Bill got a kick out of that too. So. No idea. And, and again, you, you have a great resource there of all these fabulous artists from their work, their stories, and their perspective on what happened. Um, theirs is equally or more um, authentic of a view as mine, and I hope people take advantage of their presence there and um, talk a little story with them and, and enjoy their work. And uh, those who know or don't know, there's Bill has curated an exhibit as part of the Webster Gallery exhibit down on on the show floor, and all of these uh, wonderful artists. Is Rick here? Rick Allen? Sorry. Uh, Rick Allen is also here. Uh, he's not with us in the room right now, but Rick Allen's work is also there, who is part of Bill's crew. So I didn't see Rick, that's why I didn't say his name, but Rick is also part of the crew. He's here, and um, they're part of the show, so I'm sure after this, they're probably gonna be down around their work, and if you wanna talk to them, that's fine. Uh, also, again, I'll, I'll do my little commercial for five seconds. We're doing a screening of the film this afternoon. I don't, at 5.30, I was, thank you. And then um, the, uh, the film is also up for sale in the exhibit, uh, Wexler Booth. So um, if, if you're so inclined, uh, that'd be great, but. Uh, Where are you screening? Sorry? Where are you screening? Uh, I'm not sure about the space. It, it's screening a couple times, so. In the VIP con conversation space, and what time is the first one, 5.30? 5.30 this afternoon. It's also being screened again tomorrow at 5.30, and again on Sunday at 3.30. And uh, today, I'll, I'm only in town today. I'll introduce it, and I'll do a Q&A after the screening as well, so for those who, you know, who can or want to come. Well then, I'm going to ask you, this has to go, Skype or no Skype, it's got to go about 4,000 miles, so I'm, I'm going to ask you to join me in thanking Bill for taking a part out of his day. Thank you, Bill. Thanks again to the Wexlers and to uh, everyone else who helped organize this. And Bill, thank you again. And we'll do this again sometime. Yeah. Thank you very much, Bill. It was a pleasure. Oh my God! <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> great to see you. It's so great to see you. Oh my God! <laughs> have such a good life. And